you know, I can, I, I want to get right into the word. There's, there's such a powerful and a thick anointing that's in this, in this house this morning. I just want to stay right in it. But before I get into the word, I just want to uh, get into the mind of, of, of Moses. Originally, Moses did not want to go to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to release the people of God. He didn't want to do that. But then he came to the knowledge that, or the understanding that he had to obey God, right? And see, the, the Israelites were in, in, in bondage in Egypt, but God had heard their cry, and he wanted them released from that place of bondage. And this morning, I can only imagine how he felt. But I want you to know this morning that in a sense, I can sense and I can feel the way Moses probably felt because there's some of you in this house this morning that you're in bondage in your mind. You're in bondage in circumstances. You're, you're in bondage in, in places but God has sent me through the Word of God to bring you from out of your Egypt into the promised land, into the land that's flowing with milk and honey. Somebody say, God saw about me. I'm, I'm going to give you a some, some, uh, little bit of a backdrop. There's a man in the Bible by the name of David. He became king of Israel at one point in time. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God. He was obedient to God. But David was just a man, wasn't he? Let me say it again. David was just a man, wasn't he? He, he was far from perfect, but he served a perfect God. And, and, and there came a time where Israel was, at, was getting ready to go into a battle. And for whatever reason, David stayed at home. And probably one morning, David got up and he looked out over the fence. And the Bible says that a woman by the name of Bathsheba, was bathing herself, and I can only imagine she was a gorgeous woman to look at. And David found himself lusting after Bathsheba, lusting after this woman that did not belong to him, this woman that was not his wife. And it got to the point towards he sent someone to find out who is that woman, he came back and told him who she was. So speed the story up. David had an affair with this woman and got her pregnant. But he tried to cover up his dirt by having her husband to come back who was out in battle and come in under her. If you know what I'm talking about. He, he came home and he was with his wife and they were intimate. Because see, David wanted him to think that that was his baby because she was already pregnant. But once that didn't work, David had this man killed. David had this man killed. He, he, had this, he got this guy's wife pregnant which was wrong, it was sin, and he had her husband killed. How many of you know sin is sin? We categorize sin, whether it's great big sin or a little bitty sin or even a little bitty lie. How many of you know that a little bitty white lie is a great big black lie? No matter how we try to sweeten it up or chop it up, but God is the forgiver of them all. Can I get a witness this morning? So, so, I guess in a sense, David kind of figured that, you know, okay, I've got this taken care of. He's dead. Nobody really knows about this except for me and God. But God ain't going to tell nobody, right? So now the story picks up in 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting with verse number 1. 2 Samuel chapter 12 starting with verse number one. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. I'll give you just a few seconds to get there. Second Samuel chapter 12, starting with verse number one. If you're one to write in your Bible, I want you to underline that phrase, the Lord sent Nathan. Skip unto, and then underline the word David. I hear some of you guys still turning. That's okay. I'm going to tell you a brief little story about when I was a kid. Uh, how many of you guys remember the time where if, if you were over your grandma's house or somebody's house where you, you didn't put nothing on that Bible? Don't you put your cup on that Bible? Well, I still don't put nothing on the Bible, but you know what I'm trying to say. How many of you know that we can worship the Bible but not worship the God of the Bible? See, did you know that the Bible is just a book? Let me get, let me get my Bible. Can I? How many of you know that the Bible is just a book? until you apply your faith and believe what's on the inside of this book. 
It's just a book until you apply it to your life, until you believe that it's the written Word of God. It's God's love story to you and I. And the Lord sent Nathan. Somebody say Nathan. Nathan was a prophet of God. And the Lord sent, who sent Nathan? God sent Nathan, the prophet of God, to David, the man who had done this wrong. And he came unto him and said unto him, here's a parable. Nathan is about to give a parable. A parable is a earthly story with a spiritual application. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, two men in one city. The one was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little bitty female lamb. One little bitty, that word you was female, one little bitty female lamb. There was a rich man that had exceeding Lambs and, and herds, everything you can think of, he had a whole bunch. This rich man, somebody say the rich man. The rich man. But this poor man had one little bitty female lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his kids. It did eat his own meat and drink of his own cup. And this poor man would lay that baby lamb in his bosom probably like his own kids. And he was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take one of his own. He came in unto the rich man. And he refused to take one from his own flock to kill it and feed this traveling man that was come unto him. That's the kind of way they did things back then. But instead of him taking one of his own, he had many, he took one. He said, he t- the Bible says he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it or killed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against this man. David was angry because he's thinking to himself, why in the world with this rich man that had plenty of livestock, would he take from this poor man that only had one that was like a kid to him, and, 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 and cook it and feed it to this traveling man. The Bible says David's anger, and, and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to the prophet of God by the name of Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. But the prophet of God said to David, David, this story that I'm telling you about, this parable that I'm laying down in front of you, David, that rich man, in this story, David, you are the man. David, you are the man who has done wrong. The prophet of God, by the name of Nathan, God sent to the man of God, by the name of David and said, you are that man. You are that man. Please hear this this morning. And this is not going to be on the screen. Unfortunately, one of the biggest misconceptions in the Christian faith is for most people, when we think of God manifesting his presence among us, it's only during the following occasions when you're alone praying to God. Sure, God will manifest his presence. How many of you guys have experienced the presence of God while it's just been you and God and you've been in prayer? Another misconception is that God manifests himself with us. His presence is during corporate prayer. Tonight, we're going to have corporate prayer at St. James Missionary Baptist Church on the north side of Fort Smith. Hundreds of Christians, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you name it, they're going to be there. And I'm expecting the presence of Almighty God to show up in that house tonight as we seek the face of God and pray on the behalf of our local communities and our nation. 
God's going to manifest. But you know what? God is not so small that those are the only places that he shows himself up. We had an absolutely incredible time of worship this morning. And the presence of God was strong in the house. Can I get a witness this morning? Also during times of prayer and fasting. Operating in the gifts of the Spirit. I'm talking about times where God manifests himself. During great preaching and teaching. When you're reading and studying the Word of God. And even during times like I taught you guys or like I shared with you a few weeks ago. Even during those times of, ad, of uh, adversity, during the times of adversity, God will show himself strong and mighty. God will show up in the midst of your unfortunate situations. Hear this, though. However, today, we see that God will even show up during times of our mess-ups. During times of our poor decision making, during times that we make mistakes, and even during the times that we commit sin, like King David, don't mean you committed adultery. Doesn't mean that you stole something from someone. How many of you know that sin is still sin, regardless of how you chop, chop it up and slice it? It's still sin, right? Yes, God will show up when you're praising, God will show up when you're worshiping, God will show up when you're praying, God will show up when you're fasting. But I want you to know that the God that you and I serve is also the God that will show up in the midst of your mess-ups. When, when people see you messing up, when people see you have blown it and they run away from you, I want you to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob won't run from you. He is the God that will show up right in the midst of your mess-ups. When you begin to condemn yourself and you realize or you think in your mind that God has given up on you, somebody needs to hear this. When you think that God has given up on you, when you think that God can't use you anymore because of where you've been, I've got some news for you. Just like God showed up through the prophet of God by the name of Nathan, God will also show up to you manifested in different ways. Here's something that you and I need to understand about grace. Here's something that you and I need to understand about G-R-A-C-E, about grace. God loves us way too much to leave us alone. Even while we're in, or even when we're out of fellowship, with him. God loves us. God loves me. God loves you too much to let you be. He loves us too much to leave us alone in the midst of our mess ups. What a great, what, what a horrible, horrible misconception is that when you mess up, God abandons you. Preacher, can you show me a little bit more scripture? Because I see that where God showed up with, with Nathan, but can you show me in the Bible where God showed up himself when somebody messed up horribly? I'm so glad that you asked me. Do you guys remember the story in the book of Genesis, the third chapter? Before we get to the third chapter, God had created Adam, and he said, Adam, I can picture God walking with Adam in the, in the midst of the garden. And God said, Adam, out of all of those trees and all the fruit that you see, everywhere your eyes look, Adam, you can eat of all of those trees, all of those fruit, except for that one right there in the midst of the garden. God said, Adam, please hear me. I'm paraphrasing. He said, Adam, on the day that you eat of that tree in the midst of the garden, you will surely die. Speed time up. God said it's not good that the man should be alone. So God caused Adam to go into a deep sleep and he took a rib and he created woman. The Bible doesn't tell about this, but I know that Eve knew because she had a conversation with the serpent. Let's go now to the third chapter and you don't have to turn. Third chapter of, of, genera uh, third chapter of Genesis. The Bible says that the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field. He was slick. He was cunning. He was sly. 
So the snake walked up or however he got there. And he says to Eve. Has God said that you can't eat of any of those trees in the garden? She said, well, God said we can't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. We can't even touch it. God didn't say that part. She added that. God said we can't eat it or touch it. Or if we do, we're going to die. How many of you know the devil will never tell you the truth or anything good? The devil then, then tells her, you shall not surely die, Eve. God knows. He's trying to keep you blinded, Eve, is what he's trying to do. Eve, God knows that on the day that you eat that tree right there in the midst of the garden, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be equal to God. Then the Bible, King James says, you're going to be as God's. But you're going to be equal as God. How many of you know we're not equal with God? God is our creator. God is our Lord. God is our, he's, he's everything to us. But he says, God knows. He's trying to trick you, Eve. God knows that on the day you eat it, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be equal to God. So the Bible says that once she saw that it was good to eat, and good to the eyes, she did partake of whatever the fruit was, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. At that moment, the Bible says that their eyes were open, and they realized that they were naked. Up until then, they walked around with not a stitch of clothes on because this human mind was not perverted at that point in time. See, they were walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh until sin came into the earth. And sin came into the earth the moment that they partook of the forbidden fruit. And the Bible says, the Bible says that when they partook of the forbidden fruit, their eyes were open. They realized that they were naked. And the Bible says that they were ashamed and they, they took some fig trees and sold them together. Then they went and hid themselves. Like you can hide yourself from God. The Bible says they went and hid themselves from the presence of God. Let's go to the eighth verse. And got it up there. Praise Jesus. And they heard the voice of the Lord God. They went and hid themselves, right? Listen. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Now, how, how's the voice of God going to walk? That's better understood as echoing. They heard the voice of God echoing in the garden in the cool of the day, early that morning, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence, underline that word, they had messed up, didn't they? They were disobedient, didn't they? Diso they were disobedient to God, but the Bible says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Yes, God is there doing praise and worship. God is there doing whatever. God's there when we pray, but God is also there when we mess up. When we know we didn't messed up, and when the devil condemns us, and when we join in and condemn ourselves with him, the presence of the Lord is here. God loves you too much to let you stay where you are. God loves you so He loves you too much to allow you to remain where you are. Now, why was the presence of God there? Why would God say, Adam, where art thou? God is omniscience. He's all-knowing, right? So why would God ask Adam where he is if God already knows where Adam is? It wasn't a geographical thing. It was a spiritual thing. God was saying, Adam, check yourself. Adam, examine yourself. Adam, you've walked out of the will of God. You've walked away from me. You've been disobedient. You knew you weren't supposed to have done that. How many of you guys have done something you had no business doing? Now, how many of you guys have done something you knew it was absolutely wrong and you asked God to forgive you, but something you slipped and you did it again or you thought it again or you went there again? How many of you have been there, done that? Maybe it was a thought. Maybe, maybe it, was, it was 
maybe it was your mouth. You said something you had no business saying. Maybe it was a habit that you had and it hadn't quite got broken yet. How many of you know that just because you get saved don't mean that instantly you're delivered from that thing? Now, some people instantly get delivered. Some people, it's a process. Somebody say process. Regardless of what it is, regardless of what your struggle was, regardless of where, why you are where you are, regardless of what your Egypt might be, God is the deliverer. God is the one that's going to set you free. You know, I, I'm not preaching this message so that you can think that sin is okay because sin is not okay. Disobedience is not okay. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Preacher, I don't understand your sermon this morning. Well, let me break it down just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. In the midst of where you are, the God that I know, the God that I serve, loves us unconditionally, loves us greater than we can fully comprehend. The God that I love paid the ultimate price to redeem us back unto himself. And even after you've been saved, sometimes you still slip up and mess up. I want you to know this morning that that God still loves you. That God is still gracious. That God is still compassionate. That God is still merciful. I want you to know that we serve an awesome God this morning. We serve a God that paid too much of a price to let you stay where you are. I can't speak for you, but I can remember back a time in my life, junior high. Not a gender thing, but this is just what I noticed. Sometimes the girls would get mad at another girl, and they wouldn't play with her at lunchtime. Or I wouldn't go anywhere with her at lunchtime. So she's sitting all by herself, all alone by herself. Because she messed up. She did something she had. Maybe she gossiped or maybe she spread out a rumor, whatever, whatever teenagers do or whatever people do. But all the buddies wouldn't hang around her. All the buddies left her isolated all by herself. I want you to know this morning that this morning maybe you're that teenager in the spirit realm and your friends have abandoned you. And maybe you're ashamed of yourself. You're ashamed of what you've done. I want you to know that God is not going to leave you by yourself. God's not going to leave you over in the corner all alone for the enemy to continue to condemn you and beat you up for what you've done. You already know what you did was wrong. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a stronghold in your mind. Maybe it's a generational curse that you're not even aware of. I want you to know this morning that just like God sent Nathan to David, that was the presence of God. That was the work of God. And just like God went to Adam and Eve in, in the midst of the garden with his presence and asked the question, Adam, where are you? One of the biggest lies that we've been told is that when you're outside of the will of God, God leaves you abandoned. God leaves you alone so that you'll come back to him. That is a lie straight from the pits of hell. Let me tell you the reason why it's a lie from the pits of hell. Because you are completely incapable of coming back to God on your own. Unless the Spirit woos you, you ain't coming nowhere. Let me tell you why. Because condemnation will chew you up and spit you out. But the love of Almighty God, He's the one that convicts your heart. Without conviction, you won't even repent. Without the love of God, you won't come back to the Father. And I am just so incredibly thankful that in those moments where you don't even feel strong enough and good enough and worthy enough and qualified enough to bring yourself back into the fold of God. God will come from heaven, manifest himself on the earth through someone, through a song somehow, and speak directly to you. And there's about three billion people on the face of the earth, but God will seek you out to bring you back. 
God will seek you out to bring you back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit who's qualified to be renewed, who's qualified to be restored by this incredibly wonderful God that I'm talking about. Number one, if you're breathing, you're qualified. Number two, if you hear my voice, you're qualified. Number three, if you believe, you're qualified. So I don't know who you are this morning. I don't know what your circumstances are this morning. I don't know where you are in your life, your walk with God or your walk without God. But I no longer want you to stay where you are, believing the lie that God has abandoned you and you are too far gone for God. See, we serve the God that will leave the 90 and 9 and go back and get that one. That's the God that I serve this morning. That's the God that I serve this morning. And see, the, the, the devil wants us to think, well, man, everybody knows what you've done and, and everybody has heard about what you've done. And, and, and more importantly, you know what you've done. You can't go back to church. God is mad at you. Let me tell you something about the church. There's not a person sitting in here that's got it all together. Not one, not a person in this place or any other church that you go to has it all together. Now, we, we might act like we got it. We might quote like we got it. We might think like we got it. We might lie like we got it. We might shout like we got it. We may dance like, but we ain't got it together. Amen. Because we're all a work undone. We're all pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That scripture, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, I'm a part of that all. And the person to your right is a part of that all. The person to your left is a part of that all. The person behind and in front of you, they're a part of that all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's here to do some reckoning this morning. God is here to do some restoring this morning. God, God is here to do some rebirthing on the inside. God's here to do some equipping on the inside. God's here to do some, some stirring up on the inside of you. God is here to do some calling to you this morning. Adam, where are you? And whoever you are this morning, you put your name in that line. Where are you? Baby, my son, my daughter. Where are you? Oh, God, I'm too ashamed. God, I'm too embarrassed because of what I've done. Hey, Jesus would say, my blood covers all of that. My, my blood has washed all of that away. All you've got to do is repent, and God will forgive you. Oh, but God, you don't realize, God, oh, yes, I realize. But God, you don't understand how long I've had this mess hanging on to me like leeches. Oh, but God, you don't realize how filthy I am and how filthy I feel. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Somebody said that the, it, it, it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Talking about the grace of God, the love of God the restoration of God, the peace of God, the renewal of God, the restoration of you. I close with this. Last slide. Maybe it's not up there. It should be the last slide. There we go. It's God's presence that tenderly loves us to repentance. That's all it is. It's God's presence. I got to be honest with you. When I think about the presence of God, when I think about some things that I've done in my life, 
I don't think about the presence of God next to me. I've thought about being embarrassed. I've thought about being shamed because that's what I was at that time. I even walked in condemnation. But man, once I recognized the fact how much my God truly and wholeheartedly loves me, even in those things I was unable to fix myself, I gave them to God. And there were times that I slipped and messed up and got dirty again. But we serve a second chance God. We serve a third chance God. We serve a multi-chance God. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? You ain't too dirty to be cleansed. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the word of God that's going forth. And Father, I know that it's penetrated the hearts of your people. And Lord, I don't know their circumstances, but you do. I don't know the grief that's in their heart, but you do. I don't know the, tr the heartache that they have, but you do. And Father, I'm just asking for healing in their spirit today, healing in their minds today to receive, oh God, your deliverance. To open up to the conviction of the Holy Spirit that causes us to repent. And Lord, even in those ways where we feel like whatever the situation is has them or has us trapped at times, we realize, Father God, that you can break any stronghold. You can break any trap. And Father, this morning is a morning of healing over, over, over your people. Yes. This morning is a, is a, is a day of, of deliverance for your people in this house. Yes. Break every chain right now. I break every chain by the power of God right now in the name of Jesus. I destroy every stronghold, every generational curse by the authority of Almighty God over every person's life. I bind every lie, every distraction from the enemy. I apply the blood of Jesus against it right now. I remove every blinded, Oh, every scale from every blinded eye right now that you might see. In every heart that's of stone, I declare that it has already been a heart of flesh and the Word of God has penetrated. Yes. Deep within the heart, deep within the spirit, deep within the soul. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask that nobody look around this morning.